Today we'll be covering Chapter 2, Tools of a Healthy Diet. News stories often highlight up-to-the-minute research. From magazines to newspapers and websites, there is a lot of information given to the public. It can be difficult to decide on what to believe and trust from the media. There is always new and improved ways to improve your diet and the latest way to lose weight. So what do you do? Who do you trust? The best way is to use peer-reviewed journal articles. Go to the source of what the media is using and read it yourself. There is also tools that you can use. One tool is the Dietary Reference Intakes, also known as the DRIs. Nutrient deficiency diseases were first identified in the 1930s and the 1940s. Men were rejected from World War II due to the discovery of their nutrient deficiencies. This made scientists realize that they needed dietary intake recommendations. In 1941, a group of scientists formed the Food and Nutrition Board to review existing research. This was the first dietary reference intake and these recommendations continue to be evaluated and revised with the latest research. We use these recommendations for people in the U.S. and in Canada because the scientists were from these countries. Within the DRIs are five sets of standards, the estimated average requirements, the EARs, recommended dietary allowances, RDAs, adequate intakes, AIs, tolerable upper intake levels, ULs, and the estimated energy requirements, also known as EERs. The estimated average requirements, also known as the EARs, are the daily nutrient intakes for half of the population. There are 17 nutrients that have estimated average requirements set. There has to be a functional marker for the nutrient to be analyzed if the nutrient intake is adequate. This can be done by evaluating the activity of an enzyme. Estimated average requirements are used for groups and not for individuals. This means that in a group, 50% will have an adequate amount of that nutrient and 50% will have an inadequate amount of that nutrient. The ultimate goals of the estimated average requirements is to prevent deficiency of these nutrients. The recommended dietary allowances, also known as the RDAs, are daily nutrient intakes sufficient for 97 to 98 percent of the population. The RDA is based off of the estimated average requirement. If there is no estimated average requirement set, then there cannot be a recommended dietary allowance. To get the recommended dietary allowance, you must multiply the estimated average requirement by 1.2. So that gives you your RDA. The goal of the recommended dietary allowance is to prevent chronic diseases instead of preventing deficiency. The RDA is the goal for usual intake. Adequate intakes are daily intake amounts for those nutrients that does not have sufficient research data to establish an estimated average requirement, which remember, it's aimed at 50% having an adequate amount of that nutrient. These are based on observed estimates of the average nutrient intake for a certain nutritional state in a specific life stage. It is expected that these levels will exceed the recommended dietary allowance, which means it will cover more than the 97 to 98% of the population. Tolerable upper intake levels, also known as upper levels or ULs, is the highest level that a nutrient can safely be consumed. At this level, it is likely to not cause any health problems. An example would be the upper level for vitamin C is set at 2,000 mg per day. Any level above this can cause diarrhea and inflammation of the stomach lining. The upper level is based on intake for food, supplements, and fortified foods. The upper level is not a goal, but rather the highest amount that a nutrient can be consumed without any bad effects happening. The estimated energy requirements, also known as EERs, are an average daily energy need for each life stage group. So this is the calories that is needed daily. The energy that is consumed above this amount is stored as body fat. 
Each person is different and these are only estimates. One's true energy requirements is based on their lifestyle and how active they are. The Food and Nutrition Board created the Acceptable Macronutrient Distribution Ranges, also known as the AMDRs. This is not a part of the DRIs. The Acceptable Macronutrient Distribution Range gives recommendations for carbohydrates, protein, and fat. There is a range of intake for each macronutrient. For carbohydrates, the range is 45 to 65 percent of your daily caloric intake. Protein is 10 to 35 percent of your daily caloric intake, and fat is 20 to 35 percent of your daily caloric intake. To make this easier to understand, take 2,000 calories and multiply it by 50 percent for your carbohydrates. That gives you 1,000 calories per day from carbohydrates. We learned in the previous chapter that carbohydrates have 4 calories per gram. This is the slide I told y'all to put a star by. This means that you would need around 250 grams of carbohydrates per day. The DRIs are used for nutrition programs like the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, also known as SNAP, the National School Lunch Program, Labeling of Nutrition Facts, Military Feeding Practices, Nutrition Policies, and Diet Planning. It is always important not to exceed the upper level for any nutrient. Another thought to keep in mind is that the DRIs are for healthy individuals and not for individuals that are malnourished or have any disease, which can increase their need for certain nutrients. Nutrient density is the amount of nutrient in a food to the daily recommended intake, so the recommended dietary allowance and adequate intake. When you are looking at nutrients, you're comparing the protein, vitamin, and mineral content in that food. Then you divide the calories in a serving of that food by the estimate energy requirements, the EERs, which determines your daily need of calories. If a food has a higher percentage of nutrients in relation to the calories, that food has a higher nutrient density. The higher a food's nutrient density, the better it is as a source for that particular nutrient. In this chart, you can see the nutrients in an 8 fluid ounce glass of a sugared soft drink compared to 8 fluid ounces of fat-free milk. If we are looking at the nutrient density of these two drinks, the milk has a higher nutrient density because it contains a small proportion of calories in relation to the vitamin and mineral content in that beverage. The sugared soft drink would be considered an empty calorie food or drink because it offers nothing more than calories and sugar. There isn't any nutrients in the soft drink. This would also make the soft drink a low nutrient density food. The Nutrition Facts panel on a food label compares the amount of nutrients in that food item with a set of standards called daily values. The Food and Drug Administration, also known as the FDA, created these standards because the DRIs are age and gender specific. It is unrealistic to have a different Nutrition Facts panel for age and gender on every package. The daily values are then separated into four different groups, infants, children, pregnant and lactating women, and people over the age of four. The Nutrition Facts Panel on food products uses the group for people over the age of four, unless it is a food specifically for infants, children, and pregnant lactating women. So infant formula is using the group for infants, snacks for children under the age of four is using those daily values on their packages. Daily values are based on two dietary standards, the reference dietary intakes, also known as the RDIs, which are set for vitamins and most minerals. RDI values for people over age four are set at the highest RDA value for any life stage group. If the nutrient does not have an RDA, the adequate intake level is used. This is used to calculate percent daily value on nutrition facts labels. Daily reference values are standards for energy producing nutrients. These include fat, protein, saturated fat, carbohydrates, and fiber. The daily reference values are used to calculate percent daily value 
on nutrition facts labels. The FDA chose 2,000 calories as their reference for calculating the percent daily values for the energy producing nutrients. These include 35% for fat, 10% for saturated fat, 60% for carbohydrates, and 10% for protein. Almost every food has a daily value on the label. Labels have to include the product name, name and address of the manufacturer, amount of product in the package, ingredients in descending order by weight, common allergens, the country of origin for meat, poultry, fish, fresh and frozen fruit, and vegetables, peanuts, pecans, macadamia nuts, and ginseng must be listed. The FDA is monitoring the labeling requirements. The percent daily value is listed on the nutrition facts label as well. The serving size listed on the nutrition facts label is what a typical portion size of what an American would eat. There is consistency among foods. For example, ice cream brands have to have the same serving size. This is so consumers have consistency when comparing products. So if we're looking at a nutrition facts label, the things that have to be included on the label include the calories, the total fat, saturated fat, trans fat, cholesterol, sodium, the total carbohydrates, total sugar, added sugar, which was something new added recently, fiber, protein, vitamin D, potassium, calcium, and iron. The percent daily value is based on one serving size. If you consume more than one serving size, you have to add to the percent daily value. This can be very beneficial in helping you determine how many nutrients and calories are consumed. If we look at this nutrition facts panel, you will see at the top the servings per container. That tells you how many servings are in one package of food. This box has six servings in the box. The serving size varies from different foods. This box has one pouch as a serving. If you look at a 16 ounce Coke, the entire bottle is a serving size. If there is more than one serving in a container, you have to add the total amount of servings you consume for the calories and nutrients to determine your percent daily value. The ingredients are listed in order by the highest percentage of weight. The top ingredient in this box of Micromac is enriched macaroni product. The daily values are based on a 2,000 calorie diet. This is stated in the bottom of the nutrition facts label. Nutrients to consume less of are total fat, saturated fat, trans fat, cholesterol, total and added sugar, and sodium. If you look at the nutrition facts label, you will see that these nutrients are in the top portion of the label. The nutrients that you want to consume more of are listed below the thick line on the nutrition facts label. Nutrient contents claims are those that describe the nutrients in food. You can see low in fat, rich in vitamin A, zero calories, low sodium. All of these must comply with the FDA regulations. For example, to claim that an item is low in sodium, there must be 140 milligrams or less of sodium per serving. If they have more than 140 milligrams of sodium in one serving, then they cannot make that nutrient content claim. Health claims describe a relationship between disease and a nutrient or food. Health claims have to use the words may or might in the sentence. For example, a diet with enough calcium may reduce the risk of osteoporosis. There is scientific agreement that calcium is involved in osteoporosis later on in life and that consuming a diet high in calcium can reduce that risk. We know that sodium plays a role in hypertension. So another example of a health claim could be a diet low in sodium may reduce the risk of hypertension. Only foods that meet the following guidelines can have a health claim. The food must be a good source of fiber, protein, vitamin A, vitamin C, 
calcium, or iron before any nutrients are added, which is known as fortification. It must provide 10% the daily value for at least one of those nutrients. A single serving cannot have more than 13 grams of fat, 4 grams of saturated fat, 60 milligrams cholesterol, and 480 milligrams of sodium. If the food item has any of these, the food cannot have a health claim associated with it. An example would be whole milk. We know that it is high in calcium, but because whole milk is high in saturated fat at 5 grams, it cannot have the health claim that calcium reduces the risk of osteoporosis. You will also see structure function claims, which describes how a nutrient affects the human body structure or function. An example is iron builds strong blood. These claims do not focus on reducing disease risk. The FDA does not approve or authorize these types of claims on packaging. Manufacturers are responsible for ensuring the accuracy of their claims. Something that is fairly new is front of package labeling. This is something that has been beneficial to consumers who read nutrition facts labels. You can easily identify the calories, total fat, sodium, sugar, fiber, and other key nutrients without having to flip the package to the back. The USDA has an extensive database with all calories and nutrients associated with different food items. In fact, you can download the database and this is what the apps you use for food loggings use. There are still numerous food items that have not been analyzed as this takes years to research. The nutrient databases may not account for prepared foods either. Each ingredient has to be analyzed separately. These nutrient databases can be used to see the nutrient density and energy density associated with each food. If we are looking at the energy density of foods, this is the amount of calories per gram of the food. Energy dense foods are those that weigh very little but have a high calorie level. Some food items would be nuts, cookies, fried foods, snack foods. To actually feel full from these foods, you have to consume a lot of them, but this is a bad idea because they have a lot of calories in a small serving. Low energy dense foods would be lettuce, fruits, vegetables, and other items that have a high water content. These foods help you feel fuller quicker without adding the high calorie content. Menu labeling helps consumers that are eating out at restaurants, especially large chain restaurants. It helps consumers know the calories associated with the food they are eating. You can see the high fat and sodium content of food items. If you look at these two pictures, which one do you think has more calories? The small McDonald's french fry or the strawberry shake from McDonald's, also a small, so they're both small sizes. Which one do you think has more calories? I'll give you a minute to think about it. Okay, so one is 490 calories and one is 230 calories. Now that you're looking at these calorie levels, which one do you think goes to which? I'm sure you're thinking French fries are bad for you, they're high in calories. However, when you're comparing these two, actually the small McDonald's French fry is 230 calories. The small strawberry shake 490 calories. So looks can be deceiving if you're looking at these two. For a chain restaurant to provide the nutrition content of their food, they have to have at least 20 locations or more. This also applies to companies that own vending machines. If they have 20 or more vending machines, they have to provide nutrition information. The ultimate goal is for consumers to choose healthier options once they see the amount of calories, fat, and sodium in the food they are eating. Subway was notorious for their health claims on commercials with people dropping pant sizes from eating at their restaurant, and they quickly gained popularity for people dieting. 
Unfortunately, if you look at the picture above and the calories associated with their sandwiches, you can see that some of these sandwiches are not low calorie. If you didn't have the nutrition information for these food items, maybe you would get a foot-long Italian BMT. If you look at the calories, you know that a foot-long Italian BMT has 900 calories. If you look at the 6-inch, you know that it's 450 calories. Looking at the menu labeling and having this has really helped know the nutrition content of foods from restaurants. As Americans, we consume too many calories, too much fat, sugar, and alcohol. At the same time, we consume too little whole grains, fruit, and vegetables. Because of this, Americans are at risk for cardiovascular disease and cancer. That is where the Dietary Guidelines for Americans come in. The Dietary Guidelines are the foundation of the U.S. Nutrition Policy and Education, and they are updated every five years. The goal is to meet nutrient needs while reducing the risk of diseases. These guidelines are used for government programs like SNAP, WIC, and school lunch and breakfast programs. My plate is also based off of these dietary guidelines. The basic recommendation for the dietary guidelines is that nutrient needs should come from food sources. The five key recommendations are following a healthy eating pattern across the lifespan. A healthy eating pattern includes fruit, vegetables, protein, dairy, grains, and oils. The second recommendation is to focus on variety, nutrient density, and amount. To meet the nutrient needs within calorie limits, choose a variety of nutrient-dense foods among and across all food groups. So this means different types of protein and different types of fruit and vegetables. You should not consume the same fruit and vegetable every day. The third recommendation is to limit calories from added sugars and saturated fats and reduce sodium intake. So cutting back on foods that have higher fat content and added sugars. The fourth recommendation is to shift to healthier food and beverage choices. You should be drinking water every day and changing from soda to milk because of the nutrient density. The fifth and final recommendation is to support healthy eating patterns for all. This includes going to school, work, and at home. My plate took the dietary guidelines and put them in consumer terms so it's easier to understand. If you look at the picture, you will see the transition of the USDA food guide. In 1992, food was grouped into a pyramid. That's this picture right here. The items we should consume the most of are at the bottom and the least at the top. If you look at the pyramid, bread and cereal was on the bottom of the pyramid beneath fruits and vegetables. So that means we were recommending to eat more grains. Then in 2005, my pyramid was created and this included exercise and that's exercising up the pyramid. Each different color in the pyramid was associated with a different food group. Then in 2011, my plate was created to show everyone what a typical plate should look like for every meal. This includes half of your plate being fruits and vegetables, the other half divided between grains and protein with a glass of milk. My plate has three recommendations. The first is to balance calories. Everyone should enjoy their food, but should consume less of it. This means avoiding oversized portions of food. The second recommendation is to increase the amount of fruit and vegetables consumed. Half of the grains you eat in a day should be whole grains, and all dairy products should be changed to fat-free or skim milk. The third recommendation is to reduce certain foods. One being the amount of sodium consumed by comparing sodium content in soups, bread, and frozen meals. Also, drinking water instead of sugary drinks. You will notice that my plate does not recommend one certain food. It also does not recommend only one food group because no one certain food group has every nutrient. 
It is a combination of all food groups that provides the necessary nutrients. You should be consuming different foods within each food group as well. So if we are talking about vegetables, you should be consuming green beans, broccoli, carrots, zucchini, cauliflower, all within the vegetable food group. This depends on personal preference. The most important thing is to choose a diet that is high in variety. You also need to watch your serving sizes of foods. My plate does not have an area for oils, which was the difference between the older versions of my plate, the pyramid and the my pyramid. This is not considered a food group, but you do need essential fatty acids. My plate recommends fish and plant oils, such as olive oil, at least twice a week. Empty calorie foods are those that are high in solid fat and added sugar. These empty calorie foods add calories, but not nutrients. These types of foods include cakes, cookies, pastries, donuts, ice cream, soft drinks, cheese, pizza, hot dogs, and bacon. These foods contain solid fat and added sugars.